So my name is, uh, is uh, Julia Borras, and I'm a researcher here at the Institute of Robotica Informatica Industrial for the, from the Perception and Manipulation Group. And I'm going to talk about a little bit, not only about my research, but uh, I'm going to try to give you an overview of different research projects that we do at our group. Mm, uh, not all of them, because we have some more, but uh, the, maybe the, the, the bigger ones or, or some of them. Then mainly the one related between cloth manipulation and assistive robotics. So for to give an idea of the landscape uh, that we are, we have two main applications in our uh, in our research. One is cloth manipulation, that is like the manipulation of these type of objects that are highly deformable and they are very uh, challenging because of course they have a lot of self occlusions and they also are like um, so they are difficult to perceive when you touch them they deform a lot. So it's difficult to, to, it's very challenging to manipulate them in a way that the robot understands what is going on. And on the other hand, the assistive robotics, that this is these robots that can help people in different applications. It can be in the healthcare, but also in, in different agricultural, also we have projects on agricultural applications, etc. On the other dimension, we also do research in learning by demonstration, also perception and representation of these deformable objects development of manipulation skills, mainly cloth manipulation skills, but we can also talk about general manipulation skills. Then we are also, we have uh, people also experts in high level planning, that is in the decision making, the robot understanding what is the situation and what action can, can take next. Also about explainability, that is explaining why the robot did something or uh, or why it failed to uh, to do something or six or simply explain what is happening in the in in, in its uh, mental state so that the user can understand what what is the robot doing or why is the robot doing what is uh, what is doing which is also related with human robot interaction which is of course inherent in the assistive robotics uh, uh, application no? where you have robots helping humans, so therefore there must be human-robot interaction and we must care about this interaction so that it's smooth. So in this context, we have several several projects. Maybe one of the biggest ones is the Clothilde project. This is an, an advanced grant that Carmen Torres won back in 2018, so it's already finishing and it's about the fundamentals of understanding the mathematical principles behind uh, cloth manipulation, cloth deformation, how cloth deforms, how we can represent and how we can learn by demonstrations and uh, to, to manipulate it. Then another, this uh, Clotilde, I put it a little bit more towards the assistive because we have some use cases that are more on the assistive part, also on cloth manipulation. Chloe Graph is a national project that is mainly about also cloth manipulation, but more than representing the deformable object, representing what is a full task uh, of, of manipulation of the formable object, how we can represent these, uh, these states, how we can represent the full task so that the robot is able to plan accordingly, understand and simplify the, the, the perception of, of these different states. Softenable is also a new project that we have in the, in the part of cloth manipulation, but we have a strong use case on a hospital environment where we need to provide support to the nurses that are dressing protective equipment, equipment another, another, another task that I'm, I'm going to explain briefly, a little bit more in detail. So it's also about the formable objects and in particular cloth manipulation, but it's also on, like we, we, are, we are always pivoting between this, the, these two applications. Coherent is a project, it's a Chistera project, also European, that is mainly about explainability, but on manipulation tasks and in particular on cloth manipulation tasks. Well, taking the, the idea that in a robot system it's not exactly the same that just one network black box that solves one problem, but in, re in reality in a robotic system we are solving many problems at the same time, so there are several explanations that might happen at the same time and we need to be able to merge them in a, in a way that makes sense. So this is more on the lower explainability and human-robot interaction side. Robin is purely an assistive robotic project uh, and it's about robots that are going to be in uh, helping in long-term interactions with elderly people and our users here, our um, subjects here that, that we want to help are both the users, so the elderly people, but also their caregivers. So the robots that are in the house and, and they, we have to develop manipulation skills, we have to plan, 
but we have also to be able to explain and work also on privacy issues of data that we might be collecting maybe without them realizing, etc. Also, SecureOps is an European project that is about, uh, about uh, investigating privacy issues when you have a robot, a robot in, a, in a public environment. TRAIL is an European network, doctoral network, uh, that is about trustworthy robotics. So basically, that's a very relevant idea lately in the recent years for the European Union, with all these uh, black boxes, uh, deep learning, uh, um, networks that decide things and, and have very good results, but are very difficult to explain. So we think in the future, we have to have robots among us and a lot of artificial intelligences uh, around us that take decisions for us. We need to be able to explain what is going on and what is the internal state of, of, of the robot and why is it behaving in a certain way. So this project is about that. And finally, the meter is also about manipulation. Victor? Yes? We lose Julia? I'm going to... to sorry? Comment. Yeah. Ah, no, sorry. Did you say anything? Yes, it, 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 it cancelled your, your connection during... Like, oh. Yeah. I am back? Yes. No, it's correct. What did you mean? The last uh, 30 seconds. Okay, fine. I'm, I'm going to go through. Basically, these are the European projects, um, and the rest are, 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 national, are national projects. So we start with the Clotilde. This is an, uh, the, the name of the project is Cloth Manipulation Learning from Demonstrations. It's, an, uh, it's, an, it's a grant that Carmen Torres won on, on back on, on 2018. And it's about giving the, the, the versatile cloth manipulation uh, techniques no? in three main application domains, housekeeping, uh, housekeeping and hospital logistics. So this kind of uh, cloth uh, items appear in, in a lot of uh, environments. So as, for instance, in the logistics of like uh, bed sheets in the hospital, but also at, at the homes, in the handling of um, retorts in the clothing uh, internet business. For nowadays, we buy a lot of things online and most of the times these clothes, we try them, we don't like it, they are big, they are small, we need to return them. So the companies need to deal with a lot of boxes that when they open, they find the clothes that they have been tested like worn and then put it back in the cloth. They can be in any configuration, and normally this is done manually. They need to take them out of the box, fold them again so that they can put be back in the system of the warehouse. So that's something that still needs uh, a lot of investigation to be able to automate this, this task. And finally, more the, 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 the assistive task that is helping to dress. For, for instance, for elderly or disabled people. These are the application domains, but the project is mainly about um, developing topological and machine learning techniques to be able to learn. For instance, different representations of uh, cloth and motions uh, of, of these kind of objects. And I'm going to explain very briefly some of the novel representations that, that, that we that we develop also about uh, manipulation planning and control techniques with this soft like when you when you um, interact with people you need to have this soft control so that the, the trajectories they, they follow the trajectory but it's not hard if they touch something it, it, the robot acts like a, as a soft thing so that it cannot harm people and also learning from demonstrations and doing re reinforcement learning so we have this demo where they, that we teach the robot in, in, by, with a demonstration how to put a scarf and then the robot can do it in a way that is soft, no? that, that it cannot harm people. So one of the novel... We have a, we have a question, Julia. Ah, sorry, yeah. The chat. Sorry, I don't see anything, so you need okay. to stop me. The question is, is cloth manipulation a topological problem or something else? It, it can, I mean, cloth manipulation is a very general term and there are many aspects. There is the perception, there is like how to represent the cloth. So there, there are pro topological problems associated, like in, 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 in particular, we have been developing topological uh, ways of representing or finding simplified representations of this, of this cloth. But it, I wouldn't say cloth manipulation is a topological problem. 
because that's a very generic, both topological and cloth manipulations are both very broad concepts. I'm going to go a little bit into that now. So for instance, this is the, the, the virtual reality framework that, that we develop. The idea is that if we have humans demonstrating human um, cloth manipulations, we have the problem that with the current perception techniques, we cannot understand well what is the state of the cloth, what is the state of the formation, because there is a lot of self-occlusions, and you cannot represent well what, what is happening to the cloth. If you do, on the contrary, we can do cloth, uh, th things in simulation and learn from simulation, which we do a lot. The problem in simulation is that you don't have the human in the loop, so you cannot correct mistakes. The trajectories have to be like parameterized in a way that you don't actually see how is gonna what is gonna happen. You think about the trajectory, you execute the, the the simulation, and then you see what happened to the cloth. But you you are not there in the loop. So this uh, this system allows to interact in real time with the cloth, and also have it's a simulation, so you have full information. With this system, for instance, we could collect a data set of different folding uh, uh, different fo folding sequences. In this case of a rectangular cloth, but it could be generalized to other shapes. And then, oh, sorry. And then what we did is also developing this uh, this uh, representation that is based on a topological index between. So these are 28 coordinates. This h square here represents a coordinate, and this is as a heat map of these coordinates. So how they change the value while the the, the cloth moves, and each one of these uh, values is a formula that uh, it's the Gauss linking integral, which is a topological index between the two segments. Like, and the segments that we care about are these that are marked in red. So basically what we care is about the corners, but not exactly the corner, but the whole environment of the corner. If it flips, because then it changes sign, etc. With only this representation and only with distance, we can already separate very well different states of the formation which then allows us to put them semantic tags to each one of these states that this representation separates in a way that actually makes sense for us. So we could train very easily uh, a system that is able to, to understand what is the semantic tag. For instance, folded, like folded in half, uh, flat, or one corner folded, etc. different states. So here we applied a little bit of topology because this gauss link integral is actually a, a topological index uh, from from is actually from from not te not theory that that computes if you actually do for a whole curve it computes the the the, the width or the or the linking number between these these two curves. So I, I go to the, 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 next, uh, the next project that is soft enable. This is, it has a, a long title towards soft fixture based uh, manipulation primitives, enable safe robotic manipulation in hard source healthcare and food handling applications. So it's a super long title, but basically it has two, two things here, the soft fixture based manipulation and the application domain. The soft fixture here, uh, 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 it means uh, that we are gonna both use soft robots and soft objects like cloth or food uh, like meat and fish that are soft and in addition these kind of objects normally are not fully constrained because when you grasp them you don't constrain the whole object this is actually this project is about caging so caging is about when you grasp an object you normally firmly grasp it that you cannot move it but when you grasp it like that this object is not grasped but is caged it means that its configuration space is bounded. It cannot escape, but it's also not fully constrained. So that would be a soft fixture. That actually happens all the time when you grasp cloth, because you don't fully constrain the whole configuration space of the object. So soft fixture is like a, a, a novel term that we invented for this idea of the, the duality between soft objects, but also soft constraints. And the application domain is the, the this uh, in our uh, our partner. So our role in the project is, is, is working with the hospital with the idea of manipulating and picking up different objects that are dressing objects like this protective equipment to handling to handle them to the, the nurses that need to dress. And the other application domain is this like handling meats in a the the, the partner is Ocado, that is a super an online supermarket that wants to be able to prepare automatically these this cut meats when you order them online. So when we started the project and interacting with the nurses, 
Uy. Wait, because this has volume. Can you? I'm gonna just remove the volume. Um, otherwise, it's very difficult to to follow. The idea is that we talk to them, and, uh, and they told us, "Well, yes, we need the help in 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 this dressing equipment." But in addition, another task that would really help us is this open of, opening of sealed bags. And then they told us that in each surgery, they need to open between sixty and seventy of these bags. This and and then in the morning that they do several surgeries, maybe they ended up opening maybe two hundred of these bags, and this is just in a single operating room. So if we could automate this, this is a, this is of course a, a difficult a difficult manipulation because you need to separate the layers and then pull them apart and then offer the object that is is uh, is clean inside the inside the bag. And so we are actually investigating if you can actually solve solve these types using these principles of, of soft fixture manipulation. Um, the next uh, the next project is Chloegraph. This is a national project that is uh, the title. All the titles normally in projects are quite self-explanatory. This cloth-like objects grasping, representation, and action planning. So this, uh, this is a project from me and Guillermo Arena, and it's about not that much how to represent exactly the deformable object, but how to represent the whole scene. So if we take uh, uh, the, the, in a robot system, we have this execution loop where we have a decision-making model where the robot takes decisions and selects what is the action that needs to happen next. Then the action needs to be execution, executed, and the robot needs to be able to perceive what happened with this action that, that the robot did and what is the current state that we ended up. So we need to recognize what is the current state and then decide again what we, what we can do next according to what happened. In cloth manipulation, this state recognition is, uh, is the, the, the difficult part. So most of the research happens in this state, how we can recognize these states. And normally, it's happening in recognizing and grasp cloth states. That means when the cloth, we are not touching it, it's on the table, we look at it and we try to understand. In our group, we are working under the assumption that we have these three main macro states, which are folding states that require to manipulate the cloth in this folded state without unfolding them. Then a cloth that is already flat on the table, and we may need to, to fold it, like this, do these folding sequences that we were seeing before. And then the, the crumpled state. The crumpled state is a different story. Here, you cannot really do anything. Maybe recognizing edges and corners so that you can grasp it and put the cloth in a state that you can recognize what is going on, fold it, or do other tasks. What we propose in this context of the project is that in addition of these ungrasped cloth states, we can also pay attention on what is the grasping state and the environmental contact state. That is, if it's touching the environment or if it's actually grasped and hanging in the air, etc. Because this is going to give us a lot of information and simplify what we can recognize. So our idea here is that we want to represent the whole scene as a graph so that we have less states to recognize, so that it can simplify the number of states to recognize. We can represent the different strategies to be able to, to have a decision making. And we are also investigating what are the parameters that need to be the low level parameters that need to be defined in each one of these states so that we can execute tasks on them. For instance, if it's, fro if it's uh, crumpled, the location of the corners so that we can go there and, and, and grasp it. And we would like to learn that from data, from human demonstrations. So what we did first um, in, this, uh, in this example is record um, people manipulating, manipulating cloth. And in this case, they were actually doing with, with grippers so that it, it, they had less dexterity than humans. And then we were manually, for, initially manually, segmenting the cloth every time that there was a change in grasp state every type uh, of contact with environment or the deformation state or where the, the location of the graph was happening. We did that with several subjects and even though they were asked to do exactly the same task, they all did it the, the same task with different strategies, different sequences and different number of steps. So um, in this representation, we are able to collect all this information in a graph. Here we see that each one of these states represents a, a, a scene of the a, a state of, that corresponds to a different grasp uh, state, location of the grasp, and if the, if the object is touching or not the environment, etc. So here we see already that in this graph, we have segmented the scene in a way that we have the first, all the first strategies 
converge towards having the cloth hanging in the air um, in front of the of the users and then placing it flat on the table and start the, the first folding sequence, the second folding sequence, and the last folding, the last fold. They do it in different ways, but they mo the, but all the subjects, the eight subjects that, that we collected, they actually converge into this stepping stone. So we know that basically. What this means is that in reality, this is a task that it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it can be divided in subtasks clearly. So also this graph representation allows us to, to also segment the task in, in this way. No? That is nice to see, okay, maybe we can study that separately. So the objectives of the, of the, of the project is the development of this representation in, in, graph, in different graph representations. Also, the, the recognizing these states, we have some preliminary results also on that. Then on the execution of the primitives to be able to, to transition between one state to the other. Um, and so that we have these building blocks that we, that we, that we can put, uh, okay, we have this stage, I wanna go to the other stage, so I need to execute this number of, of transitions. And finally, sorry, the, the high level decision making. So once you have the graph, it's actually very easy to, to pass it to a classical planning problem, like for instance, two strips, because it's transition, so it's a precondition, the effect, etc. So it is actually quite straightforward to pass to the maybe the, the most challenging part is both the representation and the and the low-level features that we need to, to, to execute this task. For instance, here we have some results on the identification of these states. So here we want to, to be able to detect. In this case, we did with a um, training and efficient net um, to, to check if the, ro if the system was able to detect these different grasping states, no? if it's the cloth is grasped or not, if it's touching the table or not, if it's folded or not, etc. all these states that, that I've been presenting. And what is interesting in this result is that we saw that the, when we do the, the attention maps, so these are the system prints, what are the, the pixels that uh, help or, or mostly influenced the decision that the network did to output the result, we can see that the, actually the network is paying attention in the relevant points that we want to pay attention to. We think that this, this is, a, is, a, is a good result in the, in the good direction. The, the application domains uh, that we have for this project, so it's different, like manipulating uh, clothes that are, already, uh, that are already folded and piling them, putting tablecloth, Placing tables, uh, place, placing cloth flats on the table, uh, etc. Okay, I'm late, so I need to accelerate a little bit. I think so. For coherent, this is actually another project on the same idea of this graph, but from the from the from the explainability point of view. So when we have a robotic system, as I said before, we might have explanation that coming from different levels, no? Maybe we have the deep learning perception tools. They, on the other level, we have a decision making that is also based on some kind of learning. And then for executing, we also learn these trajectories from different methods. And all these systems, they are able to generate explanations by themselves. But then we need to be able to combine them in a way that is coherent for the user to receive an explanation. So the objectives of the projects are to first develop this um, these uh, explanations, in a way, they are related in a hierarchical representation. Then combine them and decide what to explain. Maybe not everything is relevant. And when to explain it, maybe the robot needs to be able to autonomously decide when to deliver this explanation. And finally, pay attention on how we deliver this message, if the metrics for acceptance, no? how we evaluate if this explainability is satisfactory for the, for the, for the user. And basically, uh, the, the, main, the initial idea of the project was thinking about this same graph representation, if it can help us to deliver a cohesion, a, a, a coherent explanation, no? because we have, in each one of the steps, we, uh, we have the, the, the development of the skill to transition from one state to another, and in this skill, maybe it requires the different levels of explanation, and then we, we have them sorted in a temporal way. So we're actually working on that, and maybe it's going to be a variation, actually, of, of this graph. And also the, the use case in this case, it's, it's, it's similar use cases at the end. It's like manipulation of folded clothes and also um, with the stretch robot uh, doing uh, housing in a more assistive robotic environment. 
So for the next execution groups, now we move to more towards the assistive robotics. And the, in, in this uh, groups is user-centered security framework for social robots in public spaces. This is a project, a uh, European project from Guillem Alenya. And this project investigates about the privacy issues. When you have a, public, a, a robot that is interacting in a public space, for instance, in this, uh, in this use case, we are having a robot that is in a ferry and is going to interact with passengers, providing them information. And this project is about how we define this security framework, no? about making sure not only that the interaction with the robot is safe in the physical way, but also in the high level, in the, in the, in the privacy issues. And it's interesting in the context of this project, we recently, uh, well, they did, recently did an experiment in La Festa de la Ciencia, this is our, our ferries that they do here in Barcelona, where there is a lot of people coming. And it's a good opportunity for us to go there being a robot and be able to interact with many people. And it's a test that, uh, that is it, it, it's useful to test if the system works well, if it's robust enough to interact with people, and then to actually gather information. In this case, uh, the people were interacting with the robot, and the robot was asking them questions about, for me, they had two scenarios. In the first one, they were asking about, um, eating preferences and then the robot was able to suggest them restaurants and in other they were asking about social networks and then the robot was asking to take a selfie with them so they were actually taking a picture and afterwards they were asking a question to the people asking if they felt how they felt during the experiment if they felt that their, their privacy was intimidated or not and it was funny one of the anecdotes is that uh, even though they were asking tricky questions like if you have uh, family members that had uh, health issues with food, some intolerances, etc., uh, or they were even taking pictures of people, and, and nobody asked where these people, where where these uh, pictures were stored in any way, that that didn't bother anybody. But then it turns out that the question that bothered more people is when they were asking the age. So maybe. There is good, there's, we're going to need also maybe a, a teaching or, or a, a learning process of the users to understand uh, when we share data, what are the dangers of, of, of this kind of gathering information. So moving forward, the meter is a, it's a, uh, it's a project on the, it's also about uh, manipulation, but in, in an agricultural environment and in particular in cotton greenhouses. The idea of the project is to develop a robot. It is able to go through the field and collect these cotton balls. In particular, you know, our, our partner, which is, this is again Guillem Alenya, is about detecting these balls, quantifying how many there are, and then planning how to move. The, the, the challenge here is that the scenario changes. You cannot, you cannot do a, a, a map and like a model of the, of the scene and then plan according to that because with the wind and, and the, 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 the greenhouses every day is different. So the robot needs to update all the time um, so the next view planning is about uh, moving the robot in a way that is going to gain the maximum information to understand what it needs to collect. And then also all, our, uh, our work will also be on the gripper design to collect these balls. And again, this is, a, this is an agricultural, but it's very related because these objects are very delicate. You cannot squeeze them. You, you have to collect them in a very fine way. So it's also fine manipulation for the formable objects. Actually, we're going to apply um, previews. Can I remove Ooh. Sorry. Uh, we have previous experience because we had already a project in the past that finished in 2013 about uh, agricultural robotics, where we had a robot that was able to inspect a plan and take samples of this. So, actually, we're going to leverage the, 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 the experience we had in this project. For, for i sorry, I didn't play the video. So, here you are. The robot basically moves around, uh, builds a, a, a map of the, of the plant, and then is able to detect where the leaf is to go there and take a sample. Sorry, because I, I, I need to move. Trail, so Trail is a project uh, also for, from Guillermo Alenya that is an European doctrinal network. That is a bunch uh, of European universities that receive funding, actually a lot of funding from the European Union, to train doctoral students, like PhD students, but the, they are going to be all working in the same topic. In this case, it's transparency and trustworthy robotics. And this is very interesting because then you can work uh, in, the, in the same topic, but from many different perspectives. And in particular, this project is about uh, trustworthy. That means, what is the problem? That we are going to start having many and more robots among us, 
mostly, most of them, the ones that we actually have around us are very simple, like could be the Roomba. So they are actually not able to um, communicate very well what it is in the state. Maybe they just do beeps, rings, et cetera. So uh, we, we need to uh, investigate how to users can interpret the state of the robot and, and work on the acceptability because maybe if the robot is, cannot communicate what it's doing or why it's doing something, it might gener generate rejection of the user. So the solution proposed is to work on this, uh, following these ethics guidelines and trustworthy AI from the European Union, working on this behavior transparency and decision transparency which just basically like two sides of the same coin, but maybe behavior is more on the high level of understanding what is the internal state of the robot and investigate the different communication channels and how this can improve the, the communication on the internal state of the robots. Like maybe can do gestures, face and expressions, audiovisual signals, emotions, etc. And then on the other hand, more on the explanation of the reasoning itself. No, What is the, the knowledge that the robot has how is reasoning about it, how is taking the decisions. The idea of the European Union is be careful about these black boxes that are among us that we cannot explain. These neural networks maybe are not a good idea and we need to move towards a, a, a system that is able to explain what it's doing and why is it doing. Basically inspired in human social understanding. Then the, finally, the last project, and I left it in for the last because we are going to do an experiment related to, to this project, is Robin. This is a, a, a purely assistive robotic um, project because it's about ro robots for continual personalized assistance able to explain itself. The idea of this uh, project is to have a robot in a healthcare house for the elderly or maybe in the houses of elderly people that, uh, that might do task for the for the, and the, the the subjects here so the the people that we want to help is both the the, the users so the the elderly people but also their caregivers the idea here is that we want to be able to the robot to explain why it's doing things also personalized experience depending on what is the condition of the patient so the health care the, the the caregiver can help personalize what is the behavior that the robot should have depending on the patient state and also understanding that if you have a robot in the house, people normally tend to talk to them and we need to be able to gather information about this, uh, this interaction that now, now most of the people talk to the robot and the robot is not able, able to understand what is, what is there or gather information about this chit chat information. So this, this project is about being able to gather information about that. And the idea here, the application, so these are the, the, the enabling te technologies that we're investigating, but and then the applications are for physical health, so helping to, to, to give food, to drink, also social interactions, like maybe call the family, and also training, like reminding them that needs to do exercises, guiding them to do exercising, etc. And then we have a transversal application, that this information gathering, that is then related to privacy and like uh, informing well the user, how to inform the user, what kind of information we are gathering. So the, the objectives are this, no, how to personalize an experience that is long, an interaction that is long lasting because this is gonna be a robot that stays there for a long time. So the robot also needs to decide not only when they ask, but also to take actions alone. This continual dialogue understanding, as I said, this conversational that might be scheduled, so the robot has something and then there is, but it might be also unexpected that the person starts talking to the robot. So it needs to continually improve and learn from the, from the environment and then able to explain, not only to the, to the users, but also to the caregivers. When the caregivers arrive to the room or to the, or to the house, may explain, oh, today he slept more or less or, or like this week, has been more active, less active, etc. And then how we can do that without losing the trust between the patient and the, the robot and the, and the caregiver and the robot. No? There is a lot of issues about ethics and, and privacy that are very interesting. And in particular, we are starting working on experiments where we're gonna do sessions with elderly people and the stress robot that's gonna be there, is gonna do some of these uh, tasks and we're going to gather data and generate explanations. And in this context, we want to uh, ask you to participate in a practical exercise that we prepared about the evaluation of these explanations in the context of this project. I'm going to copy the, the form in the... So 
Where is the chat? Here. Is anybody there? Oh, am I alone? No, I'm here. Hello? I'm here. Hello. Ah, okay. I don't hear anything. I don't know why. Anyway, the idea here is like before entering the phone, um, I'm telling you uh, that um, I'm going to introduce to, to Roberto, which is the, the student that prepared the, the form that you're going to evaluate. So the idea is that we're going to show you a scene of a robot interacting with a person doing a task. And then we're going to ask several questions to the, to the, to the robot. In this, in this scenario, or maybe in variation of the scenario where something failed, and the robot is going to explain, OK, if, why didn't you do that, etc. And you need to answer if you think that the explanation given represents correctly the scene or it would be satisfactory for you as a user. Then we're going to talk a little bit about, about what, what we did here and why we did. So, Roberto, um, can, you, can you turn on the... Ah, here. So... Hello? Yeah, OK. Hello. So people can connect to the form and, uh, and do them. And when you are done, maybe you can say it in the chat, OK, I'm done. And more or less, when everybody is done, we can start explaining a little bit. We cannot explain you before, because then we would contaminate our responses to the so we're going to give some time. Is it working? Is people using the form? Please say something. OK, OK. Thanks, Bruno, for being OK. <laughs> Very good. So we we'll let you respond and watch the video and etc. Okay. I can start. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can finish up later if you have, have not finished. And I'm going to give you, I'm Roberto, I'm an engineer here at uh, the Institute of Robotics, and I want to give you a little bit of context of what you have just done or what you're doing. Um, I'm going to explain uh, explainability in, in robotics and, and what it has to do with uh, this experiment. So. Uh, we start with what is an explanation. So in, uh, in explainability for robotics, we define as explanation as um, the robot being able to justify its own actions and reasoning. And it has to uh, understand and interpret the reasoning of, of the robot uh, actions and decisions. So then you provide a clear and comprehensive um, explanation so that the human can expand its knowledge about uh, the knowledge of the robot. So it's important uh, to uh, add explainability to robots because it provides insights into the internal mechanisms of the robots and so in making them more transparent and it also facilitates trust on these robots. So, so we are more comfortable and confident uh, on relying on autonomous uh, systems. E also, you enable accountability. So if the robot does something, you can trace back why it has that, and then you can uh, fix, fix it uh, in a feature in, a, in, a, in the next update. You can also, and, and finally, for regulatory compliance, it's very useful to have robots that can explain its own behavior so that you can have a better understanding of their decisions. So some of the problems are the, um, developing accurate and interpretable models for, 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 these, uh, for these robots. Uh, and there's also this uh, trade-off between explainability and performance where if you want a black box that performs really well um, 
it's going to be a black book, a black box, and you are going to have limited ways to interpret that uh, that model and create uh, explanations out from that. And if you have a very interpretable model that you can uh, extract very robust uh, explanations, then um, you might lose some uh, performance in the process. So finally, what you have seen in the tests is that there are four types of explanations that we have introduced here. Uh, first, the causal explanation, the counterfactual explanation, failure explanation, and descriptive explanation. So all of these um, play a different role on explanations. It's not a complete list, um, and um, there could be many more questions that you can add, or even you could combine them and, and explain them. Um, and create more complex explanations. So the first one is the causal explanation. This is why you did something. And what we want is to describe the reason to perform the action. So to do this, uh, we need some causal information of what's the expected effect of an action. So, so that you can know how to, um, how, well, how you, can, you can know the reason of executing that action. The second one is the counterfactual explanation, where uh, you ask, what would you do if something? And what you do is you change the state in a way that the robot has to reason in a hypothetical or, um, um, or in a different scenario than what actually happened. Uh, and you can, and you, and you can uh, change the state and execute it from there and see what, what would uh, your actions be in in that situation. And it's important to state that it's all of these explanations are from the behavior of the robot. So it's not explanations about the, the world uh, in general, but it's explanations about the, the, the specific actions that the robot will or uh, has executed. Then is the failure explanation. When it, uh, the robot fails, it has to create a report of why it has failed and, and what caused it. And, and you have to trace this behavior up to the source of the, of the, of the error itself. And finally, this is the simplest one, the descriptive explanation where you lock and collect all of the executed uh, actions, and then you you provide all of the executed actions into a compressed and um, uh, simple way for the human to understand uh, what it has done. So that, that way you can have a report of what, of what has happened and what the robot has done in that situation. So these are the four types that uh, I have included in the, in the experiment. Um, and depending on depend, the answers generated by the robot, uh, are generated using a system that will be presented uh, shortly in an upcoming uh, presentation. I'm not done. So what we, so what we gain from uh, from doing exp uh, explainability in robotics is that we can enhance and the understanding and the trust in the robot. So that makes it way easier to collaborate with them. So. That's pretty much it. Uh, thank you for your participation in the experiment. And if you have any questions for, for Julia or for me, I would be happy to answer them. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah, in the chat. Okay. Uh, they are asking if there are openings for postdoc in the lab. The answer is yes. Please yes. send your CV. Yes. And uh, the second question is which program robot is using to explain its action? So I guess, Roberto, that is for you. Yeah. So we have created a, a system uh, that takes a, it's, it takes a PDBL a plan and it generates from that uh, the, the, the explanation. It can also use other interfaces. So it's a, it's, a com, it's a general interface that then we have 
uh, adapted these PBBL plans to to uh, to work with. But you can also extract some explanations from uh, behavior trees that we have also used them. Um, um, and well, we have created a, a specific system in order to generate that collects only the necessary information for for these explanations. There is another question. Do we need experience in yeah, yeah. No, so that's the same day. Uh, I'm the Mazen Ali that asked about the postdoc opening. Yeah, so Victor send you the, the mail jobs and please if you if you are actually interested in any of the projects that I explained today, also mention it in your email and, and explain us what you think you could contribute to and send us your CV. You're welcome. Any other question? <laughs> also, <laughs> after this, um, yeah, I don't know how master thesis, how, depending on the university that you are and the master that you are, and um, I don't know this just ja, 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 ja man where you are, but yeah. So we normally do master thesis with the university that is partnered with us, which is, uh, is UPC, but I guess we can also do master thesis. Just contact us with the mechanism that the university provides to do so, and we can talk about it. So that one, I guess, is for you, Roberto. Do you think a general language model could be used to explain a specific robot task? So we are actually using it in certain ways. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are using it to make the, we are using LLMs in order to make the translation from um, a structured explanation with, um, with all of the information to a refined explanation um, in a more natural way. So it's only to do this conversion between um, between the formal explanation and and the not so formal explanation. But it could be also used to. So if you organize your information well, I think it could be really useful to do a LLM in order to extract the information. They are I very think, powerful. Yeah, I think the importance here is to actually. Um, ensure that you are providing the correct information yes the which general models don't do they lie to you and you don't even realize <laughs> so we need to control the information but then they are very good at delivering this message correctly i mean a user-friendly map yes yeah, about the speech recognition part is there a model that is mainly used um we are not the partner doing the speech recognition it, that's upc in the project robin and um, do you know, Roberto, what are they using? Uh, yes, they were using T5 from, from Google, if I remember correctly. They were also playing with Whisper, but I'm not sure if they ended mm. up implementing it in Google. So, Any other question? Well, Victor, I think we have time until 10, right? Yes. So, so it's, it's actually... It's actually the, the time good. to move to the next speaker. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very Thank much, you. Roberto. Thank you, Julia.